So I want you to take your hand out, your right hand out, and just put it on your heart. Put it on your heart. And can you all feel something? Can you, can you all feel something? No. Okay, well, then you're dead, all right? <laughs> Okay, so we just call an ambulance. So put your hand on your heart, see if you can feel something. If you can't, it's because you're dead, all right? And, uh, but we're going to resurrect it today. Gonna, we're going to bring it back to life. Oh, Amen. Father, we just know that your kingdom is about life, joy, peace in the Holy Ghost. And we want to pray to you, our Father who is in heaven, that you would fill us now with the capacity to understand what your word has in us today, what it wants to do to us, through us, for us, in Jesus' name. We pray the revelation of your presence upon us. No matter how we feel, how we think, what we are, that you are God, you are good, and you are on our side. And we pray that revelation of knowing that you are with us in this, wherever, is, uh, is on us now. Thank you, Jesus, that we will praise you no matter what, Amen. because you are good, you are God, and you have done such great things. So we welcome you. Come, Holy Spirit. Come and have your way in us in this moment, in this time. Come and have your way. Fill your children. Fill your people. Fill your, your, your church with your presence. We need your presence, holy, holy, holy God, to enable us to get you inside of us in such a way that we say, yes, 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 you're here with us. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. Oh, Amen. Oh, Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. The heart is 22. The heart. So some facts about the heart. Bear in mind I'm speaking from the new American Standard Version uh, because it's the best. And, um, <coughs> and uh, it basically gives us the greatest detail, I think, that we need for these facts. So in the New American Standard Version, you will read 805 times. How many times? Five times in the uh, New American Standard Version, you will read the word heart. That's a lot of times. 805 times. 66 books in the Bible, and you will read 805 times in the New American Standard Version. Now, I believe, not saying it's true, but I believe that in the New International Version, you might read it a few more times, but I'm not going to get into that because I'm preaching from the New American Standard Version. So here we are. In the, book, uh, in, in the New Testament, you will, you will not see, not see, 1, 2, John and Titus. You will not see the word love. And um, in uh, the Old Testament, you will not see uh, Habakkuk, Haggai and Nehemiah in the Old Testament, so you won't see the word love. Now, there was a guy, his name was Woody Allen, I don't really like him, actually, as a person, I think he's gone now, but um, uh, he said some silly things, but one of the things he did say I heard recently, which I thought was quite profound, so I wanted to share it with you this morning, and it was this, Woody Allen says this, the heart wants what the heart wants. <laughs> the heart wants what the heart wants, and I guess it's a bit like the Old Testament when it says, everybody did what was right in their own eyes. The heart wants what the heart wants. And the, the reality of the heart has um, a profound effect on every single one of us. Whatever you give your heart to is where your future will be. So what's in your heart today is the direction you have put your sow, your rudder, for your future. What's ever in your heart well, it's today is where your future will be because we reap what we sow. We reap what we sow. So if you've got stuff in your heart today and it's not good, it will take you to a bad place. No, make no mistakes about it. Which is why we need to protect our hearts, especially as Christians. Because if we want to go somewhere, then we need to make sure that what's in us is good. Now that's not easy, in fact it's impossible and we'll discover how we do it as we journey. But the reality is that what's ever in your heart today is where you're going in your future because you are where you have been. Whatever was in your heart then is because it's brought you to this place. Because we reap what we sow. So who are you giving your heart 
2. There is a thing that we do when we become Christians. Jesus, I give you my heart. We don't actually give Jesus our heart, but there's a sense in which we say that. We give Jesus our heart. Jesus doesn't live in our heart. He lives in heaven. Uh, the Spirit lives in our heart. Actually, he lives in our innermost being, which is actually our kidneys, I think, or our liver, or something like that, somewhere down the gut area. And uh, so, But that's another topic for another day. Whoever, you give, whoever you're giving your heart to, um, whatever you're giving your heart to, who are you giving your heart to? What are you giving your heart to? The heart in Hebrew is levor, apparently. So there we are. And that basically, in a Hebrew context, it means this. It's the centre of human thought and spiritual life. Levor is the centre of human thought and spiritual life. So it's not just your emotions, your heart, but it's your thoughts too. So let's read maybe one of the special psalms as it relates to the heart. Psalm 51. If you want to turn to it, if you don't listen to the New American Standard Version. Be gracious to me. This is David. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to your greatness of your compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin are ever before me against you, you alone, you only. I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being and in the hidden part you will make me know wisdom. Purify me with hyssops and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit and I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. Create in me, says David, and he had been in some really dark places as a result of this psalm. We don't want a journey there, but he'd been in some dark places. He was not feeling that clean. And he says to God, create in me. And the concept of create is to bring into being something that wasn't there before. Create in me a clean heart. David knew his heart and his life was not right. And so he cries to God, create in me a clean heart. Bring into me something that is not there before. Create in me something that wasn't there before. And the implication is, God, if you don't create something in me that wasn't there before, I will continue the cycle of rebellion and sin. I will continue the process of living my life the way I've been living my life. So David recognised a man after God's own heart. No one else was given that privilege statement attached to his soul. Create in me, says David, a clean heart, a new heart, create in me. And brothers and sisters, I want you to have the creation of a heart for God. Or you will continue the cycle of rebellion and sin. You see, 
we are all in the same place. James' word earlier is a revelation to this word. Give me a heart that loves you more. Give me a heart, God, that loves you more. A heart that loves you so much that it resists rebellion and sin. That it chooses to follow you in your ways, to seek you and your purposes, to surrender to you the things I know about you. Give me a heart that loves you more than a heart that loves to rebel and to sin. God says in Proverbs, in the book of Proverbs 23, 26, my son, give me your heart. My son, Give me your heart. And it's a gender thing. doesn't mean anything. It's a concept of being a human being. My son doesn't mean man, woman. It means, means gender. It means who we are. It means, means the completeness of who we are. Man and woman. My son, my children, you might say. Give me your heart. God wants our heart. And if he gets our heart, then he gets our life. If he doesn't get our heart, he doesn't get our life. That's why we say we give Jesus our heart. Because it means he gets our life. They're not just words, they have to have actions. Now the heart of a Christian, <clears throat> and I, I didn't really want to write Christian because it doesn't say what I mean. Because the concept of a Christian is not what the concept of a Christian is, is reflective in the, in the New Testament. A Christian is someone who is committed to God, following God, seeking after God. A disciple, a, 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 someone who is looking to... Follow Jesus in every possible way. It's not a churchgoer. A Christian is, is someone who is engaged with God. In the last conversation I had with Gary was, have you connected? And a Christian is someone who is connected to God. The heart of a Christian is like a walled city with, art, with, with, with enemies on the outside of the walls. And that would be bad enough. <clears throat> but with traitors on the inside. With traitors on the inside. Our hearts are filled with traitors. Wanting to mess us up. But when we say to God, create in me a clean heart, what we're saying is, God says, yeah, God, 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 <laughs> God says, hey, you've got a laugh in you. God says this, I'm going to, Chip away. Did someone talk about chipping away today? It's in here, look. I ain't lying. You read it. God says, chip away out of the heart, like, um, like uh, one of those great sculptures, Leonardo da Vinci, is it, or someone like that. Yeah, yeah given a chop here and a chop there. Making it into a beautiful whatever, a representation of art. God chips away out of our hearts to take away the barnacles, create a new heart, that loves him. And you know, Christians have been so foolish for so long, thinking that God only likes them when they do good. But God loves us. And he chips away at the reality of who we are. Because the pathway of wisdom is moving from sinful rebellion to submission and surrender. You'll appreciate I am condensing these messages, they are all messages in and of themselves. But, but the, the pathway to wisdom is moving from sinful rebellion, which is what our heart does. It pursues itself and it's, it's deceived by its traitors, it's enticed by its enemies. Sinful rebellion, moving away from sinful rebellion, which is where David was in 51, to submission and surrender, creating me a clean heart. And unless you create a new heart in me, God, my heart is going to continue the cycle of rebellion and sin. Before we invited Jesus into our lives to remove our sin, we had no power at all to resist the temptation. Or the, we had no power, says Romans 8, we had no power to say no to sin because we didn't want to say no to sin. And we had no power to want to say no to sin. So we just did what was right in our own eyes. Woody Allen 
we did what was right in our own eyes. But after we become Christians, we can say no to sin. You know, when Paul says in 7 and 8 Romans, I don't do the things I ought said, find myself doing the very things I ought not to do. If I'm doing the things that I ought not to do, it's, it's a demonstration that it's not me doing them, but sin that indwelleth me. The reality of that contention of trying to resolve sin with your flesh is not possible. That's what the Old Testament represents in the journey of Israel. And Paul sums it up in those two chapters and says, you can't be good enough for God. You can't even say no to sin. But when God takes you and creates in you a new heart, then you get the capacity to say no to rebellion and sin. Because you want to say no to rebellion and sin. Because you have been given the freedom to say no to rebellion and sin. Now that doesn't mean to say that you always say no to rebellion and sin. But the possibility is now there for you. And it wasn't there before you. It wasn't there for you before. Our hearts are drawn to sin, deception, rebellion, self-indulgence, and I've summed it up by calling it meism. The serving of the flesh. Meism. Jeremiah 17 verse 9 says this, The heart is wicked and deceitful above all things. You, you can't get it more clear than that. There's 805 I could have spoken to you about. The heart is deceitful and wicked above all things. So how can we overcome the traitors within our hearts? How can we resist the temptation of the enemies beyond the walls? Brothers and sisters, the way to surrender and submission is to no longer trust in yourself. No longer trust in yourself. Put your trust in God more than you trust in yourself. I don't even take my own counsel anymore because it's not even worth it. It will take me to the enemy's camp or it will deceive me and poison my own soul. I, have lear I am learning, <laughs> I am on a journey of learning to trust in my God more than I trust in myself. Know this, there is no good thing, Jeremiah is saying, there is no good thing in me. We need, brothers and sisters, if we want to walk with a new heart, to ask ourselves when we are enticed or when we are deceived, how could I do something to hurt my God? How could I do something to hurt my God? To make my God sad? It says, delight yourself. That means to live your life every day looking for ways to please God. Not because you're going to get him to like you, but because it's your heart's desire. I love making Debbie happy. I don't do it enough. But I love to make her happy. I love to bless her. I love to, she can have anything she wants. She can, you know, I, I don't, nothing is too much for her. But still the flesh so often is not willing to put the rubbish out or to do this or to do that or to do the other. How many times has she asked me to sort out the central heating? <laughs> Delight yourself. It means to plan each day with a desire to make your, the heart of your father glad, not sad. Make him feel, feel full of joy. Not because you want to try and prove to him that you're a good person. We've, we've already established you're not a good person. None of us are. We're all, we're all, every one of us have fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every life you ever meet is fallen short of the glory of God. There are no superheroes on the earth. They don't exist. The more your heart belongs to God, the more you will love the world. You will love the people in the world, not just the world. Well, you should love the world as well, but you'll love the people who represent God in the world. You will love the world when your heart is filled with God and you belong to God. Then you will love the world and the people in it. 
It will bring you. It will lead you. It will draw you. It will suck you. It will penetrate you. It will project you into the revelation of the great commandment that Jesus spoke about when he said this. The greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God. Mark 10, um, 30, 31. To love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind and strength. And the second part of that package is to love your neighbour as you love yourself. Notice that. Not meism, you're at the end. We're at the end. Not meism, first. No, God is first. When you let God fill your heart, it will project you to the revelation of the greatest commandment that Jesus said was to bring us into that great commandment to love the Lord your God with all your, what does it start off with? With all your, with all your heart. You see, with all your heart, the, the Hebrew word, thought and mind and feelings, emotions and thought, with all of your heart, with all that you are, it will bring you into the greatest commandment to love your neighbour as you love yourself. How many broken relationships are associated with your life? I'm telling you, we're all filled with broken relationships. Well, we need to do something about those broken relationships to the degree that we can. And we know, I know it's hard. I know your lives. I know some of the people you know that it's messed up. Nevertheless, pray for them. Ask God to bless them. Pray for your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you, Jesus said. Now, you can't do that in the flesh. Your flesh might want to do that. Meism says, no, I'm not doing that. That's not what I'm going to do. But if you love God, you will represent God and the way God feels about that person. Does he love their deed? Of course he doesn't. But he doesn't like your deeds either when you do the bad that you do and I do the bad that I do. But that doesn't change his love for us. That doesn't transform us away from his presence. We need to be those who are representations of the very revelation of the heart of Jesus on the earth. That's what the church is supposed to be. Change your lifestyle is the fruit of a new understanding of God. We need to have a new understanding of God. So many of us live in the fear that God is not going to like us not going to love us if we do something wrong. That is not true. When we learn to think differently about what is true regarding God, we reverse the very curse that was established in the Garden of Eden. We break the curse when we believe again that God loves us not because of what we do, but because of who we are. God loves us. He doesn't hate us. We need to know this. God wants to mend us. He doesn't want to break us. He gives his best and gave his best, his son on the cross to save us. God is on our side. Why do we live as if God is not on our side? God is on our side. When Job found himself in a very difficult place, he cried out many times through those 40 odd chapters, why God? He didn't say it like that, but he was saying why. Read between the lines. Why, God? And until we got to verse, uh, chapter 40, verse 4, and he came to the end and he says this. That's what he said. I put my hand over my mouth and say no more. No more why, God. No more why, God. I will trust in you, not in myself. The heart makes short-term decisions because it wants to serve meism, the flesh. But let me say this to you. Eternity is a very, very, very long time. Don't give up on truth. It's a lamp to your feet, Psalm 1 and 2. Truth leads you home. Do you do any self-thinking? I heard Naomi say that earlier, which was interesting. Do you do any self-thinking? That's thinking to yourself. And what that is really is like speaking to your heart to make a decision. Self-speaking. Searching your heart. And Judges Judges 5 says, search your heart. 
David says in 51, I know what's in my heart. Brothers and sisters, what's in your heart today is where you're heading tomorrow. Until you get rid of it. Until you cleanse it. Until you get it out of your heart. And get something else there that's better for you. We need to learn to be those in our searching of our hearts to change our minds about ourselves and be reconvinced of God's affirmation to us. One of the big things that we find in humanity is when we show people the grime in their hearts, they defend themselves with self-justification. They try to justify themselves in the way they think and feel and are by reasons that would qualify them as acceptable. Self-justification, self-defence will nullify the opportunity to think right about what God really thinks about you. And that will rob you of your ability to think right and, the, and think about the truth of who you are. Self-justification will rob you of grace to be forgiven by God because of Jesus. There is only one way God is going to forgive us and that's because of Jesus and that's the only way. Um, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, I've never quoted him, uh, but Dr. Martin lloyd you ever heard him speak? It's interesting guy. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones uh, spoke on repentance and he makes a few comments and he says this, he says, repentance, the Latin meaning for repentance is to think again. Think again. And the Greek side of the meaning of repentance is this, change your mind. Think again, change your mind. It's a bit like what Judges were saying, Judges 5, search your heart, change your mind, come to a different conclusion about how things really are, what really is true. Stop deceiving yourself. Stop allowing your traitors in your heart to rob you of what is true. Stop allowing the enemy enticements outside to rob you from what is true. Believe in God more than you believe in who you are. Jesus said once a story, um, Matthew 21, 28, 32, about two sons. And he said to this one, go into the field and do this. And he said, oh, I'll go. And he didn't. And he said to the other one, go into the field. And he said, I'm not going. And he did. And Jesus asked the question, which one of them did what was right in the sight of God? And of course, the one that said he wouldn't, but then he did. He changed his mind. He walked the walk, though he didn't initially agree with Jesus. He didn't instinctively obey, but his action demonstrated his reality. His action proved what was truly there in his heart. Repentance requires action. Repentance requires action. And it starts when we start to think right about God and to abandon what we think that is wrong about God. Will King David be in heaven when heaven begins? Because heaven hasn't started yet. All who die in Christ go to the garden. Is David in the garden now, the king's garden, the paradise garden of God? What do you think? Is David in the garden? Was he a law-abiding citizen? Absolutely not. He was, yet he was a man known as a man after God's own heart. It wasn't what David achieved or accomplished. It wasn't how far he got on his journey to be good. Make no mistake, God wants us good. That's what the chipping away is. But that's not determined... Uh, his love for us is not determined by how much we consent to his chipping away. His love is absolutely free. Understanding the truth of who we are and once we have given our lives to God, lays a new foundation 
for Christ to form in us. We have been adopted by God. We are his sons, the whole thing. If we are his sons, we will give him our hearts. Don't give, him, don't give your heart to despair. Many have given their hearts to despair. Ecclesiastes 2.20 says this, don't give your heart to despair. You will never know joy. But coming to Jesus is a joyful thing. Is your heart joyful today? Maybe you haven't understood what it means to be someone who has given God their hearts. Give God your heart. Draw near to him. He will draw near to you. Don't be overcome by constant failure. Don't be discarded because you fail. Remember, remember, God loves you. And God created in David something that wasn't there. Amen. 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 Rich, you want to pray? Father, thank you that, um, that you do make us in your image. Thank you that when uh, David asked for all these things, for a pure heart, a steadfast spirit, to be in your presence, uh, for the joy of your salvation and a willing spirit, Lord, thank you that uh, your answer to all those was yes. Uh, thank you that your answer uh, to us today and this week is yes as well. I pray that we go out with your name uh, to serve the world and to love it like you do. Amen. 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 song called... Um, uh, this is my desire. And so, Father, we ask you by your grace to give us what David asked for, mm. that you would create in us, Father and God, Father our God, in Jesus' name, you would create in us a new heart, a heart that is willing to submit and surrender, to be led by you, to trust you more than we trust in ourselves. And where there are many chains and padlocks upon us, where there is fear and intimidation, God our God, merciful God, we pray you would give courage for people to pray through, to talk through, to confess sin, to let go of pain, to relinquish hostility, to allow you to purify, to send fresh living water, to make something new grow. Amen.